the death ceiling has been something I've been following ever since they technically ran into the debt ceiling back in January, right? So we've actually been in this period of multi-month period of the treasury doing extraordinary measures to, you know, manage their cash. And so back then, my key theme was that liquidity is actually probably going to be pretty good for the next several months because the treasury was forced to basically push their cash into the market because they had to spend down their cash balance in order to keep paying their bills because they couldn't finance it with new debt and they didn't and their taxes don't cover it. And so for for the you know pretty much the first half of this year, um, the debt ceiling has ironically probably been constructive for markets because the Federal Reserve has been tightening this whole time and the treasury's basically been forced to offset that. So you've had a neutral liquidity environment. So I was like, you know, a lot of things are probably going to go sideways. Some things could go up. And so I wasn't too um, concerned with markets in general. So it was, it was a, you know, somewhat bullish thing. But the point that I've been, you know, kind of concerned about for a while is that when the debt ceiling is actually resolved, ironically, um, the liquidity environment could change. And of course, this is based on what a handful of policymakers decide to do, uh, but it's something we have to navigate navigate. And so for your first question, I don't really know the odds that this particular agreement will go through. Um, there are political strategists that are watching this hour by hour to see whether or not they have the votes. Um, so I leave that to the political theorists. I kind of assume it's going to go through, but if you start to see signs otherwise, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, what I'm kind of focused on is what happens after the debt ceiling, because if they do successfully raise it, um, the treasury's already depleted their cash balance. They're, they're, they're nearly at zero. Uh, they don't really have any spare cash anymore. And so they have to go back to the debt market like they normally used to and issue more bonds in order to keep paying their bills. And they also want to refill their cash balance back up to their half a trillion dollar target, um, which basically means pulling liquidity out of the market kind of like what the Fed's doing. And so the challenge there is if they do that too quickly um, or they do it with you know a lot of longer duration bonds, they risk pulling that liquidity out of the banking sector and they risk causing another round of, of bank liquidity problems, uh, failures, uh, messy treasury auctions, messy treasury market, illiquid treasury market in general. I, I think that's kind of the key risk. And also just negative liquidity environments are bad for most risk assets most of the time. Uh, uh, or at least it's one of the big variables that affects kind of the multi-month performance of you know major asset classes. So part of the reason why the first half of 2022 was so bad for most asset prices was that liquidity was constantly going down because you had the Fed was no longer adding liquidity to the market. And back then the treasury was refilling its cash account from roughly zero after the prior debt ceiling issue. And so that was the particularly bad combination for liquidity. And we could repeat that again, but it's going to come down to what a handful of policymakers decide to do. How quickly do they want to fill that? What duration do they want to fill that? Are they going to be able to pull it out of reverse repos, which would be somewhat liquidity neutral? Or are they going to end up kind of messing it up and, and pulling it out of banks and causing a, a round of problems? So you could see that. Um, you could also see kind of forced QE while still trying to hold rates tight. Um, one of the dynamics that we saw back in 2019 was the repo spike. And back then, you basically had a flood of T-bills come to market. Um, and there wasn't really a lot of excess bank reserves to kind of pull that out. And so you, you started to get dysfunctions uh, between bank lending. And so the Federal Reserve had to abruptly stop their quantitative tightening and go to doing quantitative easing, although they didn't want to call it that because they were only doing it with, with T-bills and they were only doing it for financial stability rather than as an intended form of stimulus. Um, so the reasons for it and the, and the specifics were a little bit different, but basically they, they, they kind of lost control of their balance sheet uh, temporarily uh, due to due to actions by, you know, just overall liquidity and treasury decisions. Um, this wouldn't be a little bit different because it's not it's not that there's too many T-bills, it's that there might be too many, uh, you know, T-notes and T-bonds um, relative to cash to absorb it, relative to, you know, the money wants to stay in money markets. Um, and so I, I think you could see a similar dynamic. It's also kind of what happened back in March with the first round of bank 
uh, problems is that the you know the Fed didn't want to um, you know provide that liquidity, but they were kind of forced to temporarily. They had to open up this new facility uh, and use a bunch of existing facilities to put at least temporary liquidity back in the market. And so you could see the Fed's hand forced um, if they were to break something seriously, like if the Treasury market gets dysfunctional, um, if if you have another round of bank failures, um, if some of those kind of key markets freeze up again. I, I think this is mostly a six to 12 month story um, because this is specifically trying to refill the treasury account from an unusually low level, which really only it gets down to this level due to debt ceiling issues. Um, and we're also kind of skipping along kind of the minimum amount of liquidity that the banks can have. Uh, we kind of ran into that level back in March around the bank, um, you know, uh, crisis, uh, specifically the small and medium banks were kind of at their liquidity limit. Um, and they got refilled a little bit because these these temporary Fed actions. Uh, but if we do another environment where, you know, the Treasury is now sucking liquidity back out, the Fed's still doing quantitative tightening, we could retest those liquidity limits and kind of get another round of this. So um, when we look longer term, it, it's different types of fundamentals that I would look towards. But uh, liquidity is what I look towards when I'm trying to figure what's going to happen in three, six, 12 months, or at least it's, it's a it's a big factor that I consider among some others. Um, so, I, you know, it's been in this decade where it got very over exuberant, you know, about a decade ago. So, you know, if you go back to, say, roughly the year 2000, mm -hmm. gold has roughly kept up or outpaced the S&P 500, which is pretty impressive. Um, but all those gains were during the 2000s decade. So gold yeah. went from, you know, under $300 an ounce to nearly 2000 an ounce. Uh, it just crushed almost everything else. And then it's been in this kind of bear market sideways market for over a decade. Um, and has, has, you know, obviously given up a lot of that advantage. Um, you know, ever since the global financial crisis, we've seen a shift from central banks where, you know, for a multi-decade period, they were reducing their gold tonnage um, and investing in things like treasuries instead. And it was like this, you know, this kind of downward move. But then with the global financial crisis, you had like a V-shaped recovery. Uh, and you started to have an increasing gold tonnage among central banks. Um, and so I think as we enter a more multipolar world, um, and I, you know, I think that we kind of have a long-term sovereign debt crisis in, in much of the developed world uh, that I think is going to play out over a longer period of time. Um, I, I think gold is kind of an interesting hedge uh, in that sense. Um, I think in general, Bitcoin is is now a kind of a superior alternative in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so I'm more active and interested in the Bitcoin space. Um, I, you know, I, I do some venture capital work there. Um, I, I, I kind of work with some startups and I, I provide a lot of research for that space. Um, so I, I generally prefer that, but I, I still use gold as a diversifier. I agree. I think, you know, the next six, 12 months are very uncertain because of liquidity issues we discussed before. Uh, but when I look out two to three years, um, I think it'll have another significant bull cycle. And that's also one of the investments that I, I, I think I, you know, I, I intend to hold it for over a decade more play that, you know, goes on. And there's, you know, there's very few things that I think could change that thesis. Um, but as long as I continue to hold that thesis, um, I, I think that's going to be one of the better performing assets out there. Um, and, you know, there, I think there's still a window in the next three to five years where gold could do well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're in kind of very uncertain times right now. Um, and so uh, the way it's kind of shaping up at the moment is like gold is like central bank money and Bitcoin is like people money, uh, yeah. money for the people. And there's still this dynamic where Bitcoin is not really big enough for, for central banks to, to, you know, at least large central banks to really care about. Um, and so I think there's this window here where gold's interesting, but I do think that Bitcoin is going to be the, the better performer over most um, cycles, um, for, for at least for investors that can withstand that volatility and that are willing to do time. Time to, to research it and understand exactly what they own.